that again. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. My name is Ibrahim Hooper. I'm National Communications Director for the Council on American-Islamic Relations. Thanks for coming today for the uh, release of our latest Islamophobia report. Uh, first, uh, we'll show you a few minutes of video of a summation or a compilation of some of the uh, Islamophobic rhetoric that we've seen in uh, recent years uh, to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. Uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, a report uh, first from uh, CARE National Executive Director Nihad Awad, and then we'll have an analysis of the report from uh, Corey Saylor. Who, the author of the report. So, so first we'll hear kind of a uh, summary of the situation uh, from CARE National Executive Director Nihad Awad. Thank you, Ibrahim. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Every generation in American history has had its fear mongers. Fear mongers who target racial, religious, political and ethnic groups. Today, we, CARE, are releasing a report on the activities and funding of a network of people that made a profession, a lucrative profession, out of targeting a religious community. Who am I talking about? Islamophobes. They have built institutions since 9-11 to target Islam and the American Muslim community, a peaceful, law-abiding religious community. Today, we are releasing our report titled Legislating Fear. Our research is shedding light on a network of individuals and organizations who are manufacturing fear of Islam and Muslims, spreading fear of Islam and Muslims, legislating fear of Islam and Muslims, and profiting handsomely from spreading fear of Islam and Muslims. This Islamophobia network is having an extremely corrosive effect on the civil rights and civil liberties of American Muslims and their, on, on their safety, and on the safety of other Americans who are perceived to be Muslims. The individuals and the organizations who make up the network of the Islamophobia, conduct smear and misinformation campaigns against individuals and institutions who believe in serving the public and work in civic, public, and governmental institutions. Over the past 11 years, almost every Muslim who has been appointed or was elected has been targeted by these individuals. People who work at the White House, State Department, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Commerce, and Congress. Irrespective of their personal beliefs or practice of Islam, they all have, and no exception, been accused of preposterous charges, like being members of the Muslim Brotherhood or some other scary-sounding foreign entity. To jog your memory, I will name a few Muslims who have been smeared. Humma Abidin, the former Deputy Chief of Staff for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, the first Muslim member of Congress, Keith Ellison, the second Muslim member of Congress, Andre Carson, the White House Special Envoy to the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Rashad Hussein, student interns, employees at the Department of Homeland Security, Muslim Boy Scouts, Muslim Girl Scouts, Muslim business people. The list is endless. The anti-Muslim hate industry has also targeted places of worship, Islamic organizations, political groups, and schools. They work to block construction of mosques and the expansion of Muslim schools at zoning at zoning board hearings and elsewhere. I have been involved in community work for almost 30 years. I have been working at CARE for the past 20 years, fighting discrimination, dealing with hate groups. I have never seen this before in America. I have never seen 
an organized hate movement like this spends almost 30 million dollars a year for the sole purpose of spreading hate and fear of a religious group. These people train or mistrain, I should say, federal, state, and local law enforcement officers on how to fear Muslims. For several years, federal, state, and local officers were and in many states are still being taught biased and inaccurate information about Muslims by some of these individuals. It causes police to target innocent people and destroy police community relations which, which are sorely needed. And this mistraining was paid for by government funds enriching some of the so-called trainers. American Muslims face discrimination every day as a result of the defamation of their faith. Discrimination in the workplace, bullying in the schools, and hate crimes. They experience people throw pig parts onto mosque property, shouting and shooting at mosques, vandalism, arson, and physical assaults. These Islamophobes have a devastating impact on the American values and practice of plurality, inclusion, and tolerance. Above all, they are attempting to pass into law violations of the religious freedom protections of the United States Constitution through anti-Islam legislation targeting Muslim religious practices in the United States at state, local, and federal level. In 2011 to 2012, 78 pieces of legislation have been introduced in 29 states. Six states have passed anti-Islam legislation, the states of Arizona, Kansas, South Dakota, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. This is part of a propaganda campaign orchestrated to vilify Islamic religious practices. These groups have an impact on the behavior of people beyond the borders of this country. They endanger Americans. They inspire extremism. Andres Breivik, the Norwegian mass murderer who killed 93 people, cited Robert Spencer in his manifesto more than 50 times. These groups spend at least, or spend at least $119 million over the over four years period. On one single DVD, they spend tens of millions of dollars and they have distributed 28 million free copies who were, which were inserted in newspapers around the country, I believe, in, uh, prior to the election of Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, Islamophobia is a threat to the safety of American Muslims. It is a threat to the freedom of religion of Americans. We make these findings today of this research available to the public. Of course, we will be attacked. I mean, we will continue to be attacked by these individuals and institutions. Our purpose in publishing this information is to empower the people who are concerned about Islamophobia with accurate information about who the key players in this industry and to identify the networks. They target law-abiding Americans based on their religion. They advance conspiracy theories that harm innocent people. They exploit government agencies and exploit public funds. Making this information available to the public is a critical first step towards analyzing, understanding, and confronting this new phenomenon of hate. Finally, I would like to thank Corey Saylor for his leadership on this project. Thank you, and I welcome your questions after the presentation. Now we'll hear from the report's author, uh, Corey Saylor. Good morning. 
You have the report now, so I think you've seen it's pretty long, about 158 pages. I only expect to take about five hours to go through it. Uh, for your convenience, we've built in a one-minute bathroom break about halfway through the presentation. When we talk about Islamophobia, we want to be clear about what, what we're specifically looking at, and that is closed-minded prejudice directed at the American Muslim community. So when, for instance, during the Park 51 debate in 2010, 70 percent of Americans uh, opposed the construction of an Islamic cultural center in Lower Manhattan, we're not saying that 70 percent of the American public is Islamophobic. There were legitimate concerns within that conversation, and some people had a lot of misinformation. We're talking about the smaller core who have decided that Islam is a threat to this country and are not interested in changing their minds, are not interested in having a discussion. They're only interested in spreading fear about our faith. Now, as the image to my far left shows, when we reviewed these groups, we found 37 total groups in what we call the inner core of the Islamophobia network. These are groups that are dedicated full-time to spreading fear and prejudice about Islam. We found an additional 32 groups who use Islamophobic rhetoric in their materials, conversations, talking points, but that's not all that they do all the time. We're not going to focus too much on that outer core today, but I will mention a couple of the groups. Uh, Pat Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network and Fox News are included in the outer core. Now those 37 inner core groups, when we look at their financing, and this is a at least number, over a period of four years, they had total revenues of at least $119 million available to them. As this first chart here to my immediate left shows, they're highly interconnected. Uh, Daniel Pipes of the Middle East Forum, he's been a longtime member of the Islamophobia Network. We have quotes from him, anti-Muslim quotes, dating back to 1990. Uh, he is now funding other members of this anti-Muslim network. So particularly up top here, I like to call your attention to uh, Stephen Emerson's group, the investigative project. Uh, these guys are longtime partners, and you're talking in the order of two million dollars over a period of a few years given to the investigative project. So you have individual components of the network feeding off of each other, and sometimes they're the exact same entities. So if you look in the report on page eight and nine, you'll see that Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer, two key figures in this network, account for five groups between the two of them. So you have American Freedom Defense Initiative, Jihad Watch, both Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer are there, and they have the exact same five key leaders to those two groups. And then you add that Geller maintains Atlas Shrugs, uh, Spencer works for the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and then they're both founding members of Stop the Islamization of Nations. So it's a very tight core. Now what is this core doing that has a real world impact other than just yelling it on the internet? One member of the inner core, David Yerushalmi, wrote a piece of legislation known as American Laws for American Courts. That piece of legislation was taken by groups such as Act for America and the Eagle Forum and given to legislators in various states. And as you can see from the chart to my left, 78 pieces of anti-Islam legislation introduced in 29 states and the U.S. Congress in 2011 and 2012. 73 of these bills were introduced solely by Republicans. 62 of them are based on American laws for American courts. So you have one guy writes a piece of template legislation, puts it on the website of the American Public <coughs> Policy Alliance, which when you look at it is a group that does not seem to exist anywhere outside of the internet and a pretty website. And then from there, this piece of legislation goes to the states. And the conversation that you hear around these bills is clearly biased. So South Dakota, in South Dakota, Phil Jensen, I'm quoting him now. It is alarming how many of our sisters and daughters who attend American universities are now marrying Muslim men. There's a bill that's law in South Dakota right now. Phil Jensen was part of that. Missouri State Representative Don Wells called Sharia, Islamic religious principles, a disease. Dave Ajima in Michigan 
they do not want to live under our law. That's what he said. Now, he's no longer a state legislator in Michigan. He actually got promoted. He's now the Michigan State Committeeman for the Republican National Committee. And at least 11 states, mainstream Republican leaders supported these bills. So we're not talking about a fringe movement. Uh, Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon, Missouri House Speaker Stephen Tilley, South Dakota's Majority Whip, Michigan's Majority Caucus Chair, who I just mentioned. This movement isn't going away. This year, and this is not in the report, this is an update to what we wrote in the report, there have been 37 anti-Islam bills in 16 states. They were passed into law in Oklahoma. That's Oklahoma's second one because their first one passed in 2010 was struck down as unconstitutional thanks to a lawsuit filed by members of this organization. So Oklahoma passed a second one. North Carolina passed one this year as well. In Missouri, the only reason there's not one on the books is the governor vetoed it. So that's seven states total. And then what's the impact beyond just a, th a constitutional threat of targeting a minority religion for government scrutiny? Uh, Public Religion Research Institute shows us that in February 2012, the number of Americans who said that they thought that Muslims were working to subvert the U.S. Constitution stood at 23%. By September 2012, that number had risen seven points to 30 percent. So beyond the inner core and the outer core, what we do in the report is look at who was it that was contributing to Islamophobia, you know, who was some of the main contributors to Islamophobia during the time period covered by the report. I'm not going to give you details on all of them. It's in the report. But I do want to point out just one to give you a sense of what we're talking about. And that's Congressman Peter King. He held a series of five hearings when he was the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, targeting the Muslim community. We did a survey of four of those hearings. We decided to ignore the fifth one because it was essentially a hearing about his hearings. He started, the, he led off on these hearings saying that 80 to 85 percent of American Muslims of our, of our leadership is extremist. And then he said he hears from law enforcement all across the country that Muslims don't cooperate with them. And he said he was going to prove this during his hearings. So we looked at it during the aftermath. Uh, he had a total of 18 witnesses speaking through his, at his hearings. Of them, six of them were actual law enforcement officers. Of that, five of them did not support his thesis that Muslims don't cooperate with law enforcement. So here you have the chairman of the committee he controls the room and the witnesses that are being brought into the room. He asserts Muslims don't cooperate with law enforcement, and his own witnesses aren't backing him up. As to the 80, 85 percent number, uh, nobody took a stab at proving that. There's simply nothing out there to back it up. There's no figures. There's no nothing. Uh, my understanding, it was something that somebody said at a meeting at the State Department in 1999. So you have a member of the U.S. Congress using his position to smear Muslims, and he can't even back up his own allegations. But let me turn it around. I don't want to be Mr. Total Bad News for the day. I know that tends to be the case in these reports. But let's talk about some of the best. I want to call attention to the folks in Murfreesboro. This was a mosque that was established in 1982. In 2010, they announced that they were going to expand their premises. And these poor people went through vandalism, arson. They were shot at. They were threatened. And they were sued over a two-year period. The federal government actually ended up filing a friend of the court brief, an amicus brief, in the case, arguing that, yes, ladies and gentlemen, Islam is actually a religion. And we appreciate that the federal government did that. but. That's where we got to in this particular situation, that in a courtroom, they were arguing whether Islam was actually a religion or not. Now, they were able to open their doors in November of 2012, and they deserve enormous credit for their fortitude in going through this. And the community in which they live, you know, they were not alone. When the mosque finally opened, the imam, the prayer leader of the mosque, did say that, you know, we got a lot of hate mail, but we got a lot of supportive mail, too. And I think that's important to remember in this conversation, that while we look at the negative, there's a lot of positive going on. The other thing I just want to quickly call attention to, 
You know, for years we were working on this issue of anti-Muslim law enforcement trainers. And we still are. Uh, one of them was recently in Illinois, and we were able to get him knocked out of trainings there. But because of a series of very high-profile articles and coverage, uh, starting primarily with Spencer Ackerman at Wired.com, uh, the federal government agreed to review its material and get rid of most of this anti-Muslim training. That's a very positive thing, and we want to call attention to it. So I have two more final points. We tracked, during the time period of this report, 2011-2012, 51 anti-mosque incidents. 29 took place in 2012, 22 in 2011. In each of those years, there was a spike that we saw. So in 2011, right after Osama bin Laden was killed, we saw seven anti-mosque incidents in a fairly short period of time. In 2012, after six Sikh war worshippers were massacred in Oak Creek, we saw a spike of 10 anti-mosque incidents in a very short period. So that leads me to sort of one of our main conclusions about this network. They're there, and they have the ability to pen penetrate into the mainstream. So 2010 was their high point, but they have this ongoing thing with anti-Islam legislation, and then every so often an incident will come up that allows them to sort of get their voice in. So the GOP nominating process for the last Republican election, for the last election cycle, was one example. You had a number of candidates using talking points from the anti-Muslim network. Uh, the other clear example is when these spikes in anti-mosque incidents occur. And then the final finding that we have is one that is actually to us the most encouraging. In 2010, around about the time that this whole argument over Park 51, the Islamic Cultural Center in Lower Manhattan was going on, we were calling people and asking them how they felt about Islamophobia in America. And these are experts that we were talking to. And we were giving them a sense, you know, give us a sense on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being the best possible situation for Muslims, 10 being the worst possible situation for Muslims. And at that time, in 2010, they came out to about a 6.4 on the scale. So of concern, but, you know, not the apocalypse, but not the best situation in the world either. In 2012, in this report, we actually lower that number to 5.9. So a small decline, but I think an indicator of several positive things. Now, we recognize that, remember, we were doing those surveys during one of the biggest penetrations of the anti-Muslim movement into uh, the American mainstream, but that drop is really good. And it's backed up by something we observed after the tragedy in Boston with the terrorist attacks. So interestingly, we did not see the type of backlash after Boston that we typically see after incidents like that. As a matter of fact, Pew was able to put out a survey that showed that particularly among younger people, they were not making that these guys that conducted the bombings represented Islam connection. They were able to separate the two, just like anyone when there's an act and somebody claims that their motivation was Christianity, such as by the IRA in Northern Ireland used to happen all the time. Uh, nobody said that was Christianity. So that separation is beginning to happen. And we find that to be a really good thing because what we have found is that American Muslims are currently on the forefront of defending the Constitution in the United States through our opposition to these anti-Muslim laws. That if you're able to target one minority religion, you're going to be able to target other ones. And people understand that. So through that defense of the Constitution, I think we're showing our place in the society and our ability to use our faith to contribute. And through that information we're seeing after Boston, some portion of the American public is beginning to understand that as well, we hope. Thank you very much. We're open to questions.